While the mites are not so easy to see, being the size of a pinhead, magnified, it's easy to see where the name comes from. Their eight red legs and black body stand out against the bright green of the crops they feed on. Aggregations of the mites suck the life out of the leaf tissue, leaving a silvery surface. In big enough swarms, they can completely destroy the newly emerged plants. Paul Umina has been studying these mites for more than a decade. We do know a fair bit about the movement of red-legged earth mites. Um, we know that the actual mites themselves, when they're actually adults, don't move very far. They only move a matter of sort of 10 to 15 metres within a paddock or within a pasture or, or a crop. However, the, the eggs, uh, particularly the, the eggs that are laid and persist over summer, which are called diapause eggs, we know actually move far greater distances. So to get from one side of the country to the other is a remarkable and alarming achievement. So these eggs um, are very resistant to desiccation and they can actually be blown around on summer winds, um, several hundreds of kilometres. Um, we also suspect that the eggs can actually be transported in um, hay and silage and also caught up in soil and, and moved around in, in, uh, with livestock and or farm machinery. And so, you know, the genetic work that we've done to date has actually shown that we are actually getting movement of red-legged earth mites from Western Australia um, into the East Coast or vice versa. So we're actually getting a mixing of populations across WA and the East Coast of Australia. This is where the red-legged earth mite can be found today. They emerge in autumn to attack seedlings of cereals, pulses and oilseed crops. By late spring, adult mites are gone, their eggs left to oversummer on the soil surface. Where the first red-legged earth mites landed in Australia is unknown, but it's believed they probably arrived as oversummering eggs in soil used as ship's ballast. And while they've spread across the country, it's in Western Australia that their presence is being felt most, as Paul Umina explains. On this map, the closed circles uh, actually indicate where we've identified resistance in Western Australia. Resistance was first confirmed around Esperance in 2006. We, it's now known to be quite prevalent in a region northeast of Albany. There's also a, a property or two up here around Boyup Brook, and more recently there has been resistance identified north of Perth, which is not um, identified on this map. So you can see that resistance is actually quite widespread already within Western Australia. We know from the genetic work that the movement of resistant individuals out of WA into other states is a very real possibility. And it is in fact something that we probably predict will happen in the near future. Red-legged earth mites are typically found in high densities within paddocks and have been routinely controlled with chemicals for the past 50 years. With that amount of selection pressure over such a long period, it was inevitable something would break. And fortunately, it was only one chemical group. We only have insecticide resistance uh, confirmed in the uh, synthetic pyrethroid chemical group. At this stage, we have not identified insecticide resistance to other chemical classes. And this is important because it means farmers still have options to control red-legged earth mites that have developed resistance as long as they're using uh, the right chemicals and they're using them strategically. When synthetic pyrethroid resistant red-legged earth mites from WA were tested against a control group of susceptible mites from Victoria, the results were conclusive. And what's quite clear is that the dose response curve for the mites collected near Esperance is significantly shifted to the right, um, which illustrates and demonstrated to us that we actually had high levels of resistance in these mites. What we also found was when we actually read these mites through a generation in the laboratory and re-screened the tolerance levels of these mites, um, the results which are demonstrated in the graph below show almost a mirror image. And this actually demonstrated that the resistance was actually heritable and would be actually passed on to uh, second and subsequent generations of mites. It's not entirely sure what the mechanism conferring resistance in red-legged earth mites is, although there are some clues. We suspect that it is something called the target site modification, um, and the reason we suspect this is due to the very high levels of resistance that we're actually observing in the field, um, and that would point towards this particular mechanism that is, is responsible for 
resistance to uh, red legged earth mites or in red legged earth mites to synthetic pyrethroids. Monitoring the WA situation and establishing a surveillance program across the southern states is one of the priorities for researchers. But there are things growers can do as well. There's something called time right, which is a, a window of opportunity in spring, which, is, uh, which has been developed by CSIRO. And if uh, farmers spray during that window, what they actually do is they uh, significantly uh, reduce the, the population of red-legged earth mites that flow on to the following year. So we get up to 95% reduction in red-legged earth mite population sizes if we get our spring spray correct. Um, and so the following year we actually get a, a vast reduction in the number of mites that are emerging around that same time as the, the crop seedlings are actually getting out of the ground. Red-legged earth mites are not without enemies and the research project is also looking at the impact of shelter belts near crops and even strategic strips of grass to harbour beneficial insects. The key beneficial insects that we have within Australia that feed on red-legged earth mites are primarily other mites, so they're predatory mites. Uh, they're typically a little bit larger than the red-legged earth mite and usually they're quite brightly coloured, um, so usually a sort of a red or orange colour. The other thing growers can do is rotate insecticides and crops. Considering the paddock's cropping history and the crop risk can make a difference. Canola is probably the most vulnerable crop, uh, crop species. So coming out of a pasture paddock, making a decision as to whether you will actually put canola into that paddock or perhaps a more tolerant species such as, such as a cereal or a pulse crop is one particular thing to consider. Understanding the genetics and the movement patterns of red-legged earth mites are what Paul Yumana wants to take further. This knowledge will help predict the speed at which resistance will spread to other states. It'll also provide an insight into the likelihood and time frame of resistance developing to other chemical groups besides synthetic pyrethroids.